can't you hawk and horse with me? You can ride. And so I climbed I into the cab and then and, I um, settled down inside. You know, usually the music is ending about now, and so we're coming into it. So, so welcome to Barnstorming. Um, this is Jordy Comis, one of the co producers. Um, today marks uh, the first of two episodes we want to do, at least two about um, marking, I don't even have a great verb for it, marking, memorializing, uh, anniversarizing, if that's a word, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, today we have a couple of um, regular guests and a new a new special guest that I'll be uh, happy to be introducing. Um, let me throw it to uh, Sam, Sam Pearson first. Okay, I'm Sam Pearson. I'm with uh, Lewisburg Neighborhoods and uh, uh, basically am here wearing that hat thinking about COVID nonstop for the last year. <laughs> right. Sam, was, 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 um, was like public health messaging something you already, like, is that something from a former life or you had worked on before? No, but I mean, in as much as, well, so interesting, I actually, do you want to get into this now? Um, well, I was thinking probably <laughs> resiliency and disaster stuff is very similar. Resiliency and disaster and public, um, Road safety. So uh, there are links there. Roads are a nasty virus that's infecting a lot of America. <laughs> we have all a, over the place. We have a severe, the earth has a, a skin condition known as yeah. asphalt. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, that's great. Thank you for coming on. Dwayne, say hi, please. Hello. Hi. Hi, please. It's Dwayne. I'm Dwayne, <laughs> I'm Dwayne Heisler. Uh, my day job is with SEIU Healthcare PA. Um, but I'm also on the executive committee for the Democratic State Party, uh, chair of the Progressive Caucus and involved with lots of progressive organizations. And so I see Taylor's kind of peeking in. I'm going to toss it over to him. I don't know how long he'll be on with us, but hey, Taylor. Hey, I'm going to be on very, very shortly. But um, but yeah, uh, Taylor here, uh, co-producer along with Jordy. Um, Somewhere in mid-transit from the Scandinavian region. Yes, Um yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I've been living here in Sweden for the last two and a half years, and I'll be coming coming home, uh, hopefully before this episode comes out. I or wish ho- I ho- could ho- sing. Hopefully after this episode comes out, but before the next one. <laughs> if you we weren't going to come by plane, what mode of transit would you choose? By boat, of course. I, it- I will use this opportunity to, um, I think that we unfairly, speaking of risk communication, I think we've unfairly uh, erased, um, and we've talked about this on this podcast before, uh, uh, what are those floating balloon things? Like the Hindu Dirigibles. Bird? Dirigibles. Dirigibles? Yes. That sounds like a luxury, nice way to travel, probably very safe. There's um, totally, there, there are people working on that, right? Lighter than air uh, aircraft. Yep more sustainable and i can just imagine getting a very nice cushy room on one of those and taking a i don't know maybe it'd take a week you know to go transatlantic i'm picturing the startup company for for lighter than air it's like like the 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 energy of space x but with a crunchier nuttier vibe uh is that <laughs> about right um so um last uh but certainly the most important today um hillary rothrock who um Dwayne was kind enough to introduce us to um hillary would you like to say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself yeah hi everybody i'm hillary rothrock um i'm a single mom to two middle schoolers and my day job is taking care of my brother who's 28 and has duchenne muscular dystrophy and autism um, but I also am a big advocate for um, special needs rights and um, workers' rights. So that's your day job. Is there, I heard at least two jobs there, single yeah. mom, care provider for your brother. Is there another one? I wear many hats, um, Jordy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm homeschooling my children. So that's another few hats, I'm sure, as other homeschool parents can attest to. Um, And I'm also helping out uh, my union, SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, and United Homecare Workers of PA um, in order to meet with our lawmakers and decision makers and advocate for uh, what we need, especially going through this pandemic. So Dwayne, you told me a little bit, um, and maybe you could tell our listeners about 
um, an action or an activity that um, I think you participated in that was to raise awareness about a $15 minimum wage. Um, if I got that right, is it fast for 15? Fast for 15, yes. So um, home care workers and myself, so there were four of us from across the state. Um, Kearney Warren and I traveled across the state to Pittsburgh to fast and as Eric would put it, freeze because it was also 19 degrees out. Um, to fast, to draw awareness to the fact that there are many workers working more than 40 hours a week and still can't afford to put food on the table for our families. Absolutely. Um, did you, do you feel like you got good um, coverage or exposure, exposure, sorry, um, <laughs> from that? Um, absolutely. The community that we um, were with on this corner in Pittsburgh were very, very supportive of us. Um, the local businesses would come and offer us uh, coffee and tea, um, sometimes offering us food, which of course we could not partake in for three days. Um, I myself yeah. who, who got Who got the fasting for social justice memo and, and didn't read it very carefully? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, they, they were very supportive. Um, yeah. And and the local politicians, um, a lot of them came, came out to visit us. Ed Ganey, who's running for mayor, uh, stood with us and, and spoke at a press conference with us, um, along with several other senators. Um, Senator, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> there were many people that stopped by and nurses from local hospitals. Um, I think Dwayne's got the senator name at the tip of his tongue. Yeah, Thank so you. Hillary, how, how did, now I know you were there. You were in tents, weren't you? You were out in the in this cold, right? We were in the cold. We did not have a tent. Um, we were sitting around in a circle together in the freezing cold with those hand warmers in our gloves and our shoes, um, having to take breaks at, at local businesses for a few minutes just to warm up. Um, it breaks my heart that uh, a home care worker who I work with, um, my colleague, a friend of hers who was homeless, uh, died of hypothermia that same day that we stood outside wow. for 12 hours. And it was bitter, bitter. So, so Hillary, I, I, I know some of the struggle, we know each other um, that home care workers have. And, and I guess I, I really want to know, like, so you, this was three days, right? Was it three, over three days you did the fast and you, you, yeah. yeah, Karen and I uh, fasted for over 50 hours total because um, we wanted to do it safely. We prepared, we did our research. Um, so we started cutting back on our food a few days in advance and started with liquid diet um, just to be able to, to get through it. It's the longest I've ever fasted. So I'm really interested in how, like what you and Kiarani, like not only what you went through, but how this made you feel. I mean, during this time, you were, you were drawing attention because we were considering at that moment, whether or not we were going to have $15 an hour. And of course that did not go well. And, and just to remind listeners there, we don't have it in the state of Pennsylvania, although every bordering state has a higher minimum wage than we do. We have the federal minimum wage and we were pushing for this on a federal level, but we're also pushing on a state level and many home health care workers make far less than that. So I just want to know, like going through this process, Hillary, of, of drawing attention, you got a, a incredible coverage from what I understand. Um, how did this make you feel about the reaction that the community had to it, the, the press you received, your coworkers, and also the, the people you love that you take care of? Yeah, the Pittsburgh press was really, really great and thoughtful on their coverage of, of what we were trying to achieve there. Um, it was disheartening to hear uh, when we were there and we had people reporting to us. You know, we, It was hard to be on your phones. You can't really type. So we had people coming to us and reporting back to us what was happening in the world around us. It's very much uh, a small bubble that we were in and we were constantly meeting with passerbyers, with colleagues who stopped their cars to offer us support, um, other colleagues who sat with us, uh, friends and colleagues of mine who I've come to know over the last year who had gone homeless for two months. Um, so it was, it was uh, spiritual in nature to share that kind of community together. It was nice to be together in person. Again, I myself am fully vaccinated 
Um, so to be able to meet some of these people that I've worked with over the last year virtually was really, really incredible. Um, as far as, as back home, uh, it took a team just for me to be able to leave for a few days and go and do this action. So there were caregivers and my mother who had to take over the work that I do on the daily um, in order for me to do that. And I know that's the same for my colleagues who stood with me, um, Erica Payne and Francis Adams and Kearney Warren. Did you say, are they in the picture behind you? They are in the picture behind me. So Erica is, is over. It's hard for me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you're so much more visually, uh, uh, you have more visual acuity than me if I started trying to point right? uh, to things. <laughs> Francis is here next to me and Kearney is over here on the end. Awesome. Um, yeah, we took a lot of photos to commemorate being together. Um, and as Dwayne was saying, you know, you're in this bubble. You don't really know what's going on. We were hopeful that um, that $15 an hour would be in um, the American Rescue Plan. Um, however, we understood that this might not, you know, help that to, to pass in that capacity. And this was just a start. So we have gained a lot of followers. Um, in fact, uh, President, or I'm sorry, former President Barack Obama is now following Kiran and I on Twitter, um, which was very exciting. And when we were there out in the cold, um, someone had come to us from comms, I think, and showed us that um, Senator Bernie Sanders had had shouted out to SCIU from the Senate floor, and we were out in the cold and. That was really, really wonderful. The support and the love that we were getting from our community and the surrounding community um, made it all the worthwhile. I really oh, appreciate how you you talk about how it was a first step. And while it's disappointing that it wasn't in the American Rescue Plan, that it's not the, the end of the story. So uh, what do you see ahead? Like, are there other... Um, you know, actions specifically or asks, like what's the current ask for like listeners? Uh, the current asks are to share on Twitter and Facebook that the fact that there are these home care workers and there are these workers and these nursing home workers who need to earn a living wage to take care of their families and themselves. Um, and, and I hear the fear that people are afraid to raise the minimum wage for whatever reason they have. Um, unfortunately, what they're saying is that people who do this very important essential work for us so that our communities can continue don't deserve to be able to put food on the table. And um, what drove me to action was uh, I myself and my children had to stand in food lines um, over the last year, um, and I make twelve fifty three an hour. <laughs> so it was important just um, for me, but also for our colleagues. Hillary, first of all, thank you for the work that you do. You know, we say that we we care about our families and we say that we care about, especially our seniors, like our, our parents and our grandparents, that we really care about them. But, uh, and we all believe that people should stay in their home as long as possible, right? But yet in reality, when you look at, and I, I think of the Pennsylvania budget should, is a reflection of really what our values are. We really don't value it. If we're paying, what was it, twelve fifty an hour? And are there some that are making even less than that, Hillary? Or what is the? How does that all work? Oh, absolutely. There are dietary aides. There are housekeepers. There are home care workers who make significantly less than twelve dollars an hour. Right, right. And so, like, and 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 obviously, those are not livable wages, which is why, one of the reasons why you fasted, because the, there are times where you had to stand in food lines, and and um, you know, and you were outdoors like that, being exposed to the elements. You talk, you mentioned several times now about some coworkers, you know, that um, ended up being homeless or or whatever those things might be. But it's just a reflection of our values. Like, I think our budget should reflect our values, and somehow things are not not lining up. Hillary, it must have been, I, I can't imagine, first of all, doing that, that work, like the, like, like digging in, in that way, like, like what you've done and everything that you had to learn when this was put upon you. This wasn't like, you know, a kid, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up kind of thing, right? You know, um, and, and then, and then on top of it, a year ago, a pandemic breaks out. And what does that mean when you're taking care of a family member? Like, I, I'm wondering if, if you would mind like just going back there and creating what that felt like. 
Yeah, and I'll speak for a moment, Dwayne, about what you just said. And the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that budgets are moral documents. And I think nothing has proven that more than what we've seen over the last year. And absolutely, um, healthcare workers have not been invested in for decades. And um, what we saw here in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, was a lot of deaths. So when the pandemic hit last year, um, things were difficult beforehand. We were always short staff. There was a lot of turnover when it comes to caregiving. Um, a lot of people enter this field because it's quote unquote unskilled with no knowledge of a bedpan or what autism means or what these other uh, physical ailments such as dementia, what, what that really looks like in real life. Um, so of course there's been a lot of turnover and we've seen that and it's much worse now. When the pandemic was beginning, um, I had to source gloves and masks and other PPE, hand sanitizer, soap, all of those things. Because here in Pennsylvania, when a participant such as my brother wants to stay in their own home and they wanna hire their own caregivers, um, they become responsible for sourcing those supplies on their own. Um, and what we saw with the managed care organizations and the community health choices was that they cut back on um, the amount of gloves because there's been shortages um, all throughout the pandemic. They cut back on how much supplies they were gonna send out to the homes. So in Craig's case where he gets round the clock care, um, we need at least four boxes of gloves a month um, to provide him his basic necessities, bathing, teeth brushing, washing his all those things, feeding. Um, that the insurance company was only sending us one box a month. So it was our responsibility to source three boxes. And I don't know if you guys have followed the price of, of boxes of gloves, but it increased exponentially and it's still pretty high. So um, we be, you know, I started advocating for PPE for caregivers because as we know, many of us, um, many of us live in section eight housing, let's be real. Many of us have to depend upon um, Medicare to for, for medical assistance, you know, because we don't get those things through our job. So um, last year, having to do all that, that's where it started. So um, by March 15th, I personally had been following the World Health Organization and Governor Cuomo and, and uh, Governor Wolf's daily briefings. Um, and had figured out that we really needed to come up with some protocols for safety to keep my brother and my mother who's 70 and myself, where I have an autoimmune disease and, and heart condition um, to keep us safe within our home because we had caregivers coming in and out 24 seven. Um, and that was probably the most difficult part of the beginning of the pandemic because uh, people were not yet believing that this was happening. Um, my mom works for FEMA and my background is in crisis intervention. So um, I was prepared to, and, and kind of saw the writing on the wall that this wasn't something that was gonna be short lived. Um, but when you're a caregiver and you're taking care of someone who can't really be moved, um, we, our plan was already to shelter in place. So we were prepared by March 15th uh, to shelter in place. We did not think it would be this long, but here we are. <laughs> Um, a year later and still have very limited ability to both leave the house and, and go about our usual typical daily lives. Sam, it looked like you had, you had some comment there. Um, I just, I just wanted to follow up that definitely, I mean, our, uh, you mentioned that budgets reflect values and, and I think uh, Jordy put noted that um, in passing that, uh, you know, our values are being shown, right? Uh, th those are the values of the status quo, which does not value, uh, you know, people's doing actual labor, labor, especially in the home, uh, whether, whether it's officially paid in any way or unpaid at all. Um, that is very, and you, you enumerated, you've got all the hats, right? So you're, you're getting paid for some of those hats. You're doing homeschooling, you're caring, you know, you're, you have so many things going on. Um, it, it's outrageous that that's not re recognized. At the same time, I also feel like the last year has revealed 
that no one lives their values or very few people do. Uh, the entire concept of loving thy neighbor is just sitting down there next in the garbage can uh, th that we have betrayed our, I mean, or the people who, who cling to that or the, the scripture that that comes from really have not, you know, shown themselves in good light. Um, whether it was wearing a mask, whether it's considering people's um, rights to, to fair wages, whether it's uh, acknowledging that uh, different racial uh, groups experience uh, injustice on a daily basis. Um, now, with respect to the vaccination, it's 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 a continuing, ongoing battle to get people who are intent on insisting that love thy neighbor and everything else that goes along with it is is canon, right? Literal, biblical uh, commandments, and yet we we can't do it on a daily basis. We, we just can't. Yeah. I was um, geeking out about glove prices. Um, is $10 a box for a box of like 100? Is that typical? That's actually pretty good. We're seeing them more like 15 to $20 a box of 100. Whoa. And would they, would, did they spike over the last year? You were talking about that. The prices. Oh, okay. They doubled and then tripled in price very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, there were times where I was hearing from other uh, people who are maybe more in the know that there were shortages coming and that shortages were happening. And we tried to stock up. And the union has really been really fantastic in helping us caregivers um, source gloves and get gloves to us. They've done distribution sites. Um, and I myself have been shipping out care packages to caregivers in need who need gloves and masks. Um, we had some local sewing enthusiasts donate thousands of masks to us. Um, and so I've been sending those out as well when there's a need for them. So the distribution in um, Scranton uh, just recently. Um, so this is ongoing, right? I mean, you brought us back to March, but it's ongoing. I know just a, a week ago or so they were distributing more PPE to home health workers. Um, throughout the state, there was one up in Scranton. Um, we had the, uh, it was at the IBEW building in Scranton, set up a table all, you know, just, and had all the PPE, because because here's the thing, like, how are you gonna distribute it? People have to come in and get it. You know, you can't go to every home with it. Um, that wouldn't be a safe thing to do either. And so like, so that is ongoing. And, and Sam, I remember, and Jordy, remember in the beginning when we were working within the hub and there were folks that were talking about making the mask and, and should we be doing that or not? And, and, and should we be buying masks, but we need to keep them for the, the healthcare workers. Like just remembering all that, then there was so much debate about whether a mask was even helpful or not. And we were looking at particle sizes and trying to figure things and liability around it. There was so much that was happening. And I think the final marching orders where we came down was make them, make them. And when people come and they want to use them, we have them available. Um, so, and I know Karen, who's been on here has talked to that too, Sam. Just, I mean, I was writing about masks last year. Uh, and then I found myself again in January of this year, writing more about masks. It was, I was, I had been resisting it. I'm like, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not, and I'm like, okay, fine. So <laughs> we, and in fact, uh, you know, we're, we're now working with a group up in Lycoming, uh, Let's End COVID and uh, a, a community group that actually just presented yesterday to the county commissioners up there about a proposal for a comprehensive uh, public health messaging campaign that they'd like the commissioners to devote some of their county available funding for. And it's all been, you know, volunteer based, writing uh, op-eds, uh, creating, doing photography, creating um, billboard, you know, materials, creating flyers. Uh, and the commissioners are like, so are you looking to get paid? And we're all like, we are just asking you to do the bare minimum. Look, this is a budget that says what it would go for. It would go for billboards. It would go for PSAs. It would, you know, it, it's just for cost, not for production, nothing. Um, and it's just crazy that it's still needed, right? They're like, well, aren't you, you know, aren't other people doing that? It's like, have you seen any, <laughs> you know? Right. You tell us. I can't let go of the masks. So $50, three boxes in addition to the one that's 150 a month. If it stayed at that price, 
you know, for three or four months, that's like 450 to $500 per household. I feel like there's a bright line a little bit between Sam, at least not a bright line. Sorry. There's a line I'm trying to tease out between some of what you were saying, Sam, about people, you know, what we do value and, and that is actually unfettered markets. And we all got a huge dose of that. Um, but some of us bore the brunt of it a lot more. So at some level, um, I, I meant to not say as much, but I started down this path as you were talking, Hillary, I was just sort of thinking about like spheres, like the domestic sphere and work and gender. And so all of these things that it seems like I might be way off of my sociology, but it seems like 50 or hundred years ago, there were fewer people who lived with um, um, life challenging conditions. There were fewer people who lived as long as so we just have more people to care for. But we also, we, our society had a, a lot of times or even, you know, slave labor doing that, but we haven't paid for that labor. And now we are paying for it. We're paying the least. So, so that combined with like the market spikes for, um, for that. And also even the language you use, like I have to source, like you're talking about your household the same way with, with highly privatized economies, right? Well, we're going to source this. We're going to source that. I mean, there's whole degree programs now in supply chain logistics. That's not like a degree that existed when I was in college 25 years ago. It's a thing that's like a product of globalization, just like this pandemic spreading is a process of globalization. So I don't know if anyone's following my weird brain, but it's like, there are these connections here where all of these sort of micro details that are really important, like your experience connect to this larger picture, which is this kind of, um, you know, we, we, we set the stage for a kind of disaster, Corona capitalism, and it's running its course. And, and, and I feel like the policy language doesn't always address that, right? They're just sort of talking about this immediate need of gloves here or PPE there. They're not talking about the underlying reasons why that's even a need. Um, so I, I'm just going to stop talking now because I don't you're know if any of that made sense. You're absolutely right, Jordy. In fact, uh, caregiving in Pennsylvania has been an unmet need according to FEMA. So we were not uh, in the FEMA plans and the FEMA plans for a disaster of this type. And so there really was no mode um, in order to us, for us, I'm sorry, to get um, the PPE and the gloves and the things that the masks that we needed, even though we are paid via the state to take care of people within their homes. And these people would have otherwise been in nursing homes or hospital care. Um, so it's an unmet need. It's something that hadn't been considered and should have been considered. Um, but here's where we find ourselves, right? So we really need to, um, moving forward, create legislation and create budgets that um, are based upon reality and not just based upon um, the status quo and how things have been before. And you mentioned 50 years ago, we're talking the 1970s now, <laughs> when you say 50 years ago, we're talking yeah. about the Americans with Disabilities Act and what that means and how things have changed in the last 50 years just because of that. Um, and, and things have changed, but we all agree that we want our loved ones to remain in their homes and in our communities as long as they can. And in order for our society to do that, we need people to be able to go into those homes and do that caregiving that typically, as Sam said, would have been done by um, the woman or the housewife or, you know, an, an the unpaid, servants, the, the slaves. Servants. Yeah, the servants, the slaves, the the domestic workers, as you know, we're called. So we haven't been valued, we haven't been appreciated, and we've been ignored and and haven't been invested in in way too long. And now we're seeing um, the end results of that kind of process. And we really need to hold these conversations with our lawmakers. You know, if all of your listeners called up their representative, their senator and said, hey, I wanna to talk to you about this is happening. And what if, what if I become ill and I need someone to take care of me? What if my parent, what if my child, like my brother, he was three years old when he was diagnosed and my mother had uh, adopted him. So what if, what if a child you adopt suddenly is diagnosed with something that's fatal and that needs help? He was a make-a-wish kid. So it, it's, it's, it can affect anyone. You can have an accident and suddenly need caregiver. Um, so it's completely um, nonpartisan. This affects everybody, everyone in Pennsylvania, everyone in the country, everyone in the world. And we really need to focus on how we're gonna fix it so that it works for everyone. And part of that is getting a living wage, is making sure that people are, are included in these emergency plans and not just overlooked. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sam, were you going to say something else? I just, I, I find myself wondering, I was involved at the beginning uh, with dis- discussions. We have something called the Basic Needs Task Force in our region. And uh, I know that the Greater Susquehanna Valley United Way was working on sourcing masks, uh, including from volunteer sewing brigades. Um, uh, we enlisted, you know, Mennonites and, you know, anyone and everyone who could, man, you know, staff a sewing machine, operate it. Uh, also, though, they were they were sourcing uh, masks and uh, different um, supplies. I know that they were inter interfacing with, uh, you know, businesses that needed to continue operating, providing things for essential workers uh, that were public facing. I know that they were also doing outreach to long-term care facilities in our region. I, I'm curious, I don't know to what extent the home health care category was included in that. Now, I, I do, our, our region is pretty good and, and pays attention to things. So I like to think that they were, but uh, I'm gonna, I, I wanna find out, you know, because I don't think that's represented on the ongoing basic needs task force roster, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I wonder if we can um, um, uh, somehow it's been fine, but I think we sort of morphed from Hillary's story to about half of our show. Um, uh, but that's the way artisanal podcasting goes sometimes. Um, uh, I, I'm interested in this question about where, you know, if you think back to your, you, you know, your, your own memory of your experience, like when did the pandemic start? Um, do you feel like you covered that Hillary? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about how things changed, but was there like a moment where looking back, you're like, okay, that's when it started. Oh, whatever yeah. that means. Absolutely. So, um, Friday, March 13th <laughs> right, was the last day of school for my kids. Um, and I had made plans to meet with, uh, my partner midway, um, for two days because we knew we probably wouldn't see each other for a while. And we ended up not seeing each other for 72 days. Um, he lives in Brooklyn, New York and is a caregiver for his family. And um, I had to be here and be a caregiver for my family. We didn't think it was safe to get together for him to come here and me to go there during um, the, the lockdown. So by March 15th, everyone in the house here um, had to wear masks and we had some safety protocols in place. So for us, it, it became very real on March 15th. And um, I'll share with you guys too, because I decided that I'm done. Um, adding to this, but I've started some art at the beginning of the pandemic and I'll explain it's a bat to the listeners. Mm-hmm. And um, I've added things over time on this bat, but the thing I wanted to draw your attention to was that we started tallying um, the days of the year. So as you'll see in black is when um, I was here uh, alone, essentially with my family <laughs> doing this. Um, the blue is when I got a chance to go to New York and I was used to going there like at least once a month, um, with my kids. And then the red is when, um, he could come here and assist me, um, with the kids and and things. So, um, over the last year, I've kept a tally of every single day. And I know where I was (laughs) because there were times where I was working more than a hundred hours a week and things became very blurry. So, um, as far as last year and, and knowing that this was happening again, I didn't think it was going to last this long, but, um, it's been very difficult doing it as a single parent, um, as the primary caregiver in the house, having an older mother who is still continuing to work and myself trying to restart my career, um, because I had been an unpaid caregiver for many years up until the last three years, um, So I lived in Lancaster. If my mom was sent out anywhere in the country, she went to Iowa with FEMA, things like that, helping people in emergencies, I would have to come here and take care of Craig. Um, Or if a caregiver couldn't show up or needed the day off or whatever, they would call me from wherever I lived at the time. And I would have to travel immediately and come take care of him. But again, that was all unpaid um, until the last three years when I moved back in um, to help her take care of him. That's great. Do you, do you make a habit of painting bats? I do not. Okay. <laughs> um, it was I, really very... <laughs> I used a marker and things. Yeah. I reached out to a friend of mine, Harry Hitz, who makes bats 
and he's an amazing artist. I went to school with him and asked him, I want to do this project. How do I do this? And he helped me get started. <laughs> huh. Fascinating. Um, Dwayne, what, what are your, what's your memory from uh, when it started? Um, to be honest, what I remember is something that's probably kind of selfish. It's, it's very selfish. You know, hearing what Sil Hillary was going through, I was really looking forward to a vacation. I had a vacation planned um, for right around my birthday, which is March 25th. And um, I would have been traveling, I think the 26th or the 27th getting back. So the week before that, or 10 days before that, I was planning on a trip to, uh, to Key West, had, um, well, to, to Cape Coral, get on the Key West Express. And I was going to enjoy, cause I hadn't taken a vacation in, um, I don't know, the previous year I did. So it's, it, it had been a while. So I was really looking forward to just leaving it all behind and going out and doing that. And then friends from up here in Pennsylvania were gonna come down for a few days cause I have a, a, a home down there as well. And, I, and they were gonna visit me for, for a day or two for my birthday, go out for dinner, something like that. And um, so I was kind of like very much thinking, like, I, of course I was like, I have been watching this for like the months before. I mean, I'm kind of a news geek. And so I was like, what is going on in China? And oh my God, what's happening in Italy? Like just watching this and just saying, when is this gonna happen? Um, but honestly, I was like, okay, well, um, I mean, if it wasn't for the union and really being able to dig in, because immediately we started going to work on PPE. Like I remember reaching out to other unions. Um, I remember talking to our sister union, like SEIU Joint Board Workers United over in Easton, who has a, they have a plant there where they make baseball uniforms. And so we talked to them about making actually the mask out of the material for the uniforms and got that ball going, which we've been able to distribute to many home healthcare workers. Um, you know, like, and, and so I, I started like digging into all these projects. Um, uh, but at that very moment, I was thinking, can I go to this or can I not? And my flight was like the week after the 13th. Friday the 13th is a date that stands out for me as well, uh, Hillary. Um, and, and that's where it really sunk in and said, okay, yep, what you thought is happening is actually happening. And people are like, well, are you going? I'm like, am I going? Are you crazy? There's a pandemic. Why would I be going? Do you think that's a smart thing to do? Like I wasn't, yeah. I mean, I had come to that decision because I, and the friends that were going to meet me were kind of like, Hey, we still want to go. I'm like, no, you're going to go by yourself. I'm going to be up here. It's not going to happen. That's just not like. Like, like, pay attention. There's something going on, like around the whole world. There's something going on. We, we kind of have to put a pin in this. You know. I'm so glad that you brought that up, Dwayne, because I too, like we had scheduled um, and, and already had our room for to take the kids to DC with Craig and my mom for, for a few days. And I was supposed to be in a wedding this past year. And yeah. we were taking a trip in April out to the West Coast. And I felt like the bad guy and I very much was painted the bad guy for saying we have to cancel, we have to cancel this. Um, yeah, a, a lot. I think everybody, right, has missed out on some very necessary downtime um, and vacation time because of this. I mean, Sam at last Thanksgiving very generously said that we could all paint her as um it keeps morphing in my head. It was like Cranksgiving or you could be St. Crank a lot or something like I, I was the holiday heavy the holiday heavy that, you know, yes. you could, you could blame Sam, which, which was very, um, I mean, that's, that's, those are some wide shoulders. Um, um, Sam, do you, do you have a, a specific memory of like when it started? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was also watching the news and actually, uh, so we do a regional uh, giving day, right. Uh, Raise the region happens mm -hmm. and it was the 11th and 12th of March. And I did it. And also on the 12th, I published my first post about uh, public health as a form of neighborliness. And it's everything you want to know about coronavirus. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I sent the thank yous for people who donated. And like, the, by the next week, I was like, can we give the money back? Like, this is horrible. Like, I, I tried. Uh, we Why did you want to give it back because i just felt like people gave money and didn't know that the world was going off a cliff oh, oh, oh. like i was aware that the world might go off a cliff and and i had been ambivalent 
about the giving day and we did oh, it. Oh, you meant about the world going off a cliff because I could be, I could see Sam being like, you know what? Like we tried, we screwed up. <laughs> let it, let another species take a crack. Right. No, no, no. I, I actually, well, and there's, there are a lot of different, you know, so those are the sort of, uh, you know, various milestones, the last day of school, the, the first, you know, being the heavy, you know, I- encounters with people and saying, no, you cannot do gymnastic practice indoors with other people. And, um, and like for a really long time, and which has turned into forever. So my daughter was very much involved in gymnastics. That was the end of her career. We didn't know it, you know, it's, it's over. Uh, and, you know, that there were more meets and, you know, she was going to go to States and all sorts of plans. Um, but it was actually March 15th was also uh that was the day that I was aware of all the obituary pages in Bergamo, Italy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I lost it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jordy, do you remember like the whole bit about like wondering about food supplies and wondering about like, are we going to have toilet paper, like all of that crap, literally like, like dealing with all of that stuff. I mean, I, I remember thinking in my mind at one point and my mind's just as weird as yours, Jordy. Like I was mm-hmm. thinking, like night of the living dead and like well if this was a movie what would it look like like project one year in advance and i saw someone who was terrified running into their home trying to turn the water on washing their hands in terror singing happy birthday times you know like that was what i was like happy birthday like you know like this haunting kind of like where are we going with this i mean my mind was just spinning on on crazy stuff that i dare not even talk about i did a soliloquy from shakespeare I didn't think her happy birthday did it. Out, out, brief candle. <laughs> you know? Look at you. <laughs> yeah. Sam, did you, did you know Sir Patrick Stewart on his Instagram read through all of the sonnets from William Shakespeare each day of the of the pandemic? Yep. The whole way through. Wow. That was re- that was like my nightly like decompression time was listening to Patrick Stewart <laughs> read read Will, William Shakespeare. <laughs> I I um, yeah, um, my wife, Virginia, who's um, a writer, um, she kept a handwritten journal, which she hadn't done in a while. So she has every every day of the last year and the other day she read to me, you know, the first day. Um, so that might be an interesting thing to look back at sometime. Dwayne, it is interesting. Um, I had forgotten some of the like um, panic right around supplies, you know, um, but it was definitely there. And thinking about the other things we've talked about it's like did we did we overestimate i'm just thinking out loud did we overestimate our concern about that i don't i don't know but just thinking about our whole conversation today it's also like maybe we did but like people will like people will like trudge on and muddle through like the shortages and the problems and the crises and things will go on right like maybe we're over primed for like this idea that like everything will end right there's so many i consume too much apocalyptic you know franchises whether it's the walking dead or whatever so do you know what i mean like we have a mental template for everything will end and it's more like this like long grind of ongoing immiseration <laughs> rather than like a short sharp shock um, right it's the long emergency right it it, yeah. it it is a gradual and and grinding uh experience actually the food situation was a crisis uh, it was a crisis for many people and for many producers yeah. and for like, it was basically the toilet paper was, was a, um, a microcosm of the larger supply chains and everything got upended. Everything that normally got directed to, um, you know, public settings, like semi-public world, like restaurants and, you know, p- businesses was no longer being bought and everyone was trying to uh, get all of those things, whether it was toilet paper or food or home heating, you know, it, comfortable temperatures, we're trying to accommodate those things in their homes. And we're not set up for that. Like we shifted all of our buying, we shifted all, and but our supplying didn't shift. And it was a So a lot, of, a lot of 50 gallon tubs of cooking oil, but no one liter. Yes, very much so. And there were places that actually dealt with this. Like I I was trying to do a little project on the side with food supply and I couldn't seem to get traction, but I did find examples of other places or like a county in upstate New York that was um, uh, 
doing an amazing program with restaurants cre uh, making meals being paid to make meals and then those hot ready to eat meals being distributed massively throughout the county to people who needed them either on a you know there was like a whole schedule whether you got them three days a week or one day a week or five days a week you know they, um there was also uh wholesale diversion programs over in uh california where you know restaurants would be like okay i can i can still access stuff buy from me right like you can get your groceries from me and yes you might you don't have to buy a whole case but you might have to get 10 grapefruit <laughs> you right. know or something like that right um and so it was really interesting seeing the the creativity and the the potential for resiliency <laughs> um yeah. but also frustrating to watch like it was also it was a long emergency and it was the ultimate slow or has been the ultimate slow motion train crash because you just you can see where it's headed and it just goes there. <laughs> There's well, nothing you can do. That maybe sets up kind of a next question, um, which is um, looking back at the last year. Are there are there, you know, moments, things, trends, phenomenon, other things that have emerged that you weren't expecting, things that have been revealed that you weren't expecting? Um somebody have one of those they want to Hillary is that are you first yeah sure um so the thing that I wasn't expecting was the and, and of course in caregiving we understand that it's hard for everyone but I wasn't expecting some of my friends to no longer want to be my friend because I had responsibilities here in my house. And, um, you know, we see that a lot, either with siblings, one sibling is the caregiver and the others, you know, um, are going about their lives and aren't really involved or, um, one child takes care of the parent and, you know, the other children aren't as involved, that kind of thing. But, um, when I had to drop out of the wedding, yeah, that was difficult. Like just losing those friendships that, um, weren't as secure, you know, that you think, because as Sam had said, you know, people, claim, you know, love thy neighbor, help thy neighbor, help each other. But when it really, when, when everything hits the fan, um, it's the people that show up, you know, who, who are supportive. So losing those friendships or those relationships that, um, I think a lot of people have suffered through this year is losing some relationships, um, was, was shocking and surprising to me because here we are right <laughs> faced with this enormous pandemic um and and people did pull away from from others and of course i've had other people step in who have been just amazing and supportive and now we're much closer um but that whole process of loss and grief like we're already grieving so much loss loss of being able to travel loss of being losing our loved ones loss of our own personal health if we got if we got covid things like that um loss of not being able to do gymnastics anymore. Or I know my youngest, my 11 year old was very, very um, hurt by not being able to go to school. And we had to navigate that together and what that looks like because, because she lives in a micro nursing home, you know, she couldn't be exposed. She couldn't even risk exposure. So it was difficult for the school district to understand that too. So like my children no longer attending public school, that was a shocker to me having to pull them out. Um, because they couldn't meet our unique needs in this situation. Um, Dwayne, was there something shocking that you didn't expect in this? Well, you made me kind of think of something. And uh, I, I'm an early musician. And um, uh, you might want to specify what that means. Like you don't play uh, at six in the morning. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, actually, sometimes I do. Oh, you I, might. <laughs> Renaissance, Baroque, and medieval music is that those three, Renaissance, Baroque, and medieval, are considored early music. Like the piano is too newfangled for you. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's so out of tune. Like that's right. The lies my music teacher told me. Yeah. So um uh yeah so um I guess one of the things that really hurt is um, I have an ensemble uh, the uh, Bloom Consort that um, I've been doing for oh my gosh uh, since nineteen eighty seven. And um, and it's it's madrigal singers, it's a cappella music, and um, and we would get together very diligently once a month to put our performances together. And um, it was you know a group of up to eight people, anywhere from quartets up to eight, singing a cappella music, uh, Renaissance music, and um, 
that just hasn't happened, you know? Um, and I have kind of sort of substituted it in a way that I never thought possible was I have my, I have YouTube on my television and I get out my viola da gamba and I sit down and play with other ensembles that are just recordings on YouTube and to get that ensemble feeling because you, it's just not something you can really do alone. You just can't really do it alone. And so, and my heart really goes out to all the members of that ensemble and to, to musicians everywhere, uh, because that was the thing with all my political work that really kept me sane. And I've had to like, find other things or other ways of doing it. Um, and, um, but, but Hillary, it's nothing like what you have to deal with, with your family and with like just the, the thoughts of, of March and what you said about what you had to do to, I mean, basically stay alive, you know, to, to be safe, to create a household that was safe for you and your family. Um, but it's the loneliness that came along with that, you know? Yeah. Um, I would also like to, to mention some of the unexpected, and I would say it's people falling into different unexpected categories of ver low versus high risk tolerance. And I mean, yes, I, I'm big, I have always been big on road safety and I'm like very hostile to, to being lackadaisical about the dangers of cars and stuff like that. But otherwise I've always been kind of, you know, relaxed about things. And I have not been relaxed about coronavirus. Um, so that has been, and, and, and by contrast, there are other people who are just like, whatever, you know, chill out. <laughs> and, and I'm surprised that they are able to chill out because that's out of, out of character for them. You know? and, you mean, and you mean people who are generally empirically driven. You're not talking about like COVID deniers. Right, right. Even people who are just like, well, I'm assessing the situation and based on what I know, this, these are the you know, decisions I'm going to make. And it's still, there's a lot of leeway, right? Like, how far do you go? Now, I was never a wipe the groceries down person, but I was a think through things in, in great detail. Like, in fact, we, you know, and, and there are other people like, you know, they, they have capped the amount of mental energy they wanted to expend on, on assessing the situation they're just like i have i have figured out to the level it will be figured out and that is what i'm going with and yeah. didn't you know don't tell me anything else yeah i think one thing it revealed for me um is that um it, it revealed how um how the our our political system and i'm gonna really say more the republicans will politicize anything i mean i really thought if you had asked me in February of 2020, even with Trump president, if, well, that's not quite right because I knew that the pandemic was, I knew that the disease was out there, but in sort of mid-2019, if you had said, there's a pandemic that will hit America and it will kill more than 500,000 people, do you think that there will be a kind of World War II or Great Depression or even a 9-11, you know, moment of unity and people will, and I would have been like, yeah, I think so. Um, and, you know, I think we all know this, but to the level of the sheriff of Union County, my county commissioners, you know, I'm having to, um, as a local elected official, say like, you know, issue a letter, which is no big deal. It's nothing, right? It's not hard to do, but I'm just sort of thinking about it as an act sort of, you know, we did a public letter last summer saying, we are local elected officials, Democrats, Republicans, and we think you need to be safe, right? That that became another front in the public health communications campaign was to fight our, our own party. I'm sorry, I, I mean, not our own party, not my party, but anyway, another, you know, the other party. And and that it's persisted, you know, I've seen some of the things that like the, a lot of the people not seeking vaccines, you know, are Republicans and Trump supporters. Um, so I don't know why I'm surprised, like I shouldn't be surprised intellectually, but it still kind of hit me emotionally a little bit that, um, you know, I would be on, you know, talking to people mostly, you know, in social media and saying, I really don't want this to be politicized. These are people on the other side of the, the aisle and they're like, oh, you're just saying that. And I'm like, no, I'm, I don't know what to tell you. Right. In fact, it would be better if I were really that much of an asshole. I would just say, don't do anything because, you know, more of you are likely to die because more of Trump supporters are older and it's probably going to help me, you know, help my side. But I actually don't want you to die. So please stop politicizing this. It very much reminds me of the zombie apocalypse scenario, right? Since the beginning, um, I would take, I would have to take breaks in my car down to the river and sit there and I would cry and there would be other people in their cars also sitting by the river. And um, 
people were walking around maskless. People were, were doing things maskless at that point back in March and April. And it, it to me, I imagine them as zombie walkers, right? They're wandering around. They don't know if they're going to infect other people. In fact, each person who is potentially infected wandering around maskless could potentially infect 50,000 other people just by infecting three people that day. So um, to me, it very much still is like a zombie apocalypse where you have people who have reached adrenal fatigue or um, whatever, that they just feel safe now or are tired of following these, you know, wearing a mask this many hours. It is difficult to do, but it's not impossible just for the safety of others. You know, that it, it, it very much feels like that. And at the beginning, I felt like it was a slow motion train wreck. You could see what's coming on the back end. Um, and I, I still very much feel that way. But I, I do I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> that, yeah. If that is it, where Hillary, you're in and you can see the light. When you said the thing about losing friends, I started to get a little misty eyed. And um, like having you on has been a real like, uh, you know, honor for me personally and to hear your story. Um, and I think one of the things that's been revealed that um, I feel like I should say, but I'm also a little bit um, ashamed to say it, I guess, or, or guilty. And I try not to deal in that emotion very much, but like my life has been fine, right? Like there's the same way that ta Coates for me really revealed how being black is something lived out at the level of the body, you know, for, for you and the work you do and for so many people, there is no, like I can go all day and not wear a mask because I can work out of my home and I have enough income security that it's not a worry. And so this has been like a long staycation in some ways and I'm aware of that, but like, it's easy. And I'm saying all of this because I hope listeners who are out there maybe have been in a similar place. You're listening to a podcast. Like it's too, I, I worry that it's too easy or too comfortable for those of us who have that privilege to live in that, that, that bubble of privilege. And, you know, we need to do the extra work to, to hear out other people um, other people's stories and experiences or else the kinds of in economic inequalities that are so malicious in our society, they're going to be even worse because this might set up my next question, but, you know, great, there's a vaccine. We may be living with mutations of COVID as I understand for a long time, or there will be another pandemic. That's right. I personally, I want you to know that I really appreciate you and everybody else who has stayed home. Um, as much as you can and who wears masks out in public. I mean, that is all I asked at the beginning of this was if you can stay home, if you can afford to do that, please do that. So thank you to you for, this would be so much worse if, if people hadn't. Um, so I, I need you to understand that. Like we've been staying home too. <laughs> like we've had to, because the people that are out in the public um, aren't wearing masks you know, and, and so Craig can't afford to even go to the doctor at this point where we have, um, in fact, tomorrow, uh, hospice is beginning for him at home. So it's, um, and he's 28 years old. He hasn't been able to go anywhere, do anything. We have big plans. We go to Hershey park every summer. We, um, visit the parks around here. He likes being out in nature. He loves bird watching and things like that. Um, so for everyone that's been able to stay home, I think what we can do with our privilege now, um, is that we can go to the lawmakers and demand this change, demand that these changes happen. Um, you know, you've given up the last year, you gave up your vacations, you've given up time with your family and friends, you've given up holidays, you've done everything you've needed to do to try and, and flatten the curve and, and help in this pandemic. And now that we're coming out of it. We need to build a better future for us, for our kids, for our loved ones, for our neighbors, people in our community. You know, this is something I think everybody can get behind, but unfortunately we see not everybody will get behind it and we can't be surprised or shocked by that anymore. Um, thank you for There's saying that. There's this really weird dynamic where, you know, you argue so, uh, you know, compellingly for doing the right thing. And yet the people like, Jordy said, who have sort of, who have politicized this, strangely, they are often talking and complaining about people who are freeloaders on society. And they, meanwhile, are freeloading on the labor of people who are most exposed and the goodwill of the efforts of people who are, uh, you know, willing to sacrifice and stay home, um, you know, 
doing what needs to be done. And yet there are people out there just, you know, you can't make me wear a mask and I'm going to party. Um, and they're like, it's, it's, it's working for me. And it's like, thanks to the rest of us. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Hillary, um, I want to make sure that we get a link um, attached to this podcast so that people who can um, take up your challenge and your call to action have the, the means to do that, to reach out to their legislators and to make sure that that's updated and current. So um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, as we're, we're you know, probably getting closer to wrapping up here uh, of doing that. And um, Hillary, you know, I, when I, when we were talking about doing this podcast, I said, well, I know this woman, Hillary, and um, she is quite amazing. And um, she knows what's going on in the industry. She has lived experience that is really remarkable. And uh, especially during a pandemic. And um, I just want to say that, um, that I so much appreciate you and all of your work, both the work that you do for your family, but the work that you do within the union and, and, um, and how you are an incredible model for us in terms of, of doing the things that, that we should be doing in order to, to have a better world. And, and, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I say that with, with it, which is with all the respect in the world that I can. Um, I, just, I just truly appreciate you, Hillary. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I just kind of echoing that, but maybe going back to something we talked about earlier a little bit, and it's been on my mind, but, you know, Hillary, the work you do as a home healthcare, home healthcare worker, um, like, like in Pennsylvania, at least, I feel like there's so much more time spent about fracking and the fracking industry and the jobs it does or doesn't create and including speaking of zombie lies, the 600,000, I don't even want to say it because it's not an accurate number, but like the, the, uh, the healthcare workforce that's like below nursing right the sort of lesser skilled is huge i think you know you told me once Dwayne, a couple hundred thousand maybe in pennsylvania does that sound right there's a um, hundred and eighty three thousand positions or something like that in pennsylvania and the group that i'm a part of there's seventeen thousand of us we're the largest single group of caregivers here in pennsylvania right so i haven't measured this and there are probably ways to do it but just my intuition is that the amount of uh, of media coverage and political attention on fracking especially in manufacturing in general when our whole economy has shifted you know and that, that's a whole nother conversation but um anyways just thinking about what Dwayne was saying and appreciating you as a person but also how important it is that your voice I feel like needs to be elevated because um it's for lots of reasons just seems sort of under under reported um Hillary you you said something that um the the, the human in me feels like I should just pause on for a moment so your brother Chris um Craig. You said he's Craig. I'm sorry. Craig is going in the hospice, but, but you seemed very, um, you seemed relatively, I don't know what to say, calm about that, but he, I think you told me he's lived a lot longer than he expected. Yeah. So when he was diagnosed at three years old with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the, um, they didn't expect him to live to 18 and we've lost a lot of his friends. He's now 28 and he survived a year of pandemic. So even though his um, disease has continued to progress to a point where um, his heart rate can sometimes become way too elevated, we're talking like in the 150s, 160s, um, and his oxygen oxygen, um, saturation can drop below 90s and sometimes below 85, that um, getting palliative care in the home is a godsend. (laughs) Um, It's just my mother and I and our medical acumen that that's leading his fight because he can't physically go to the doctors. He's had a lot of virtual visits and one physical visit in the year. And he, it was too much. His heart rate went to 165. Um, that having a nurse come into the home to support us and to support him through this. And to know that, um, in case of an emergency, we can have a nurse or even a doctor right there with us. Um, instead of him having to go to the hospital where I would never see him again. It okay. is a- really just <laughs> uh, so so is it fair to say that that this is an evolution of his medical care situation as opposed to a rapid turn correct yeah it, um in december was when his heart rate started becoming really irregular and so um we had to call his cardiologist he has a team of doctors um and just making that call and not trying to stress him out I had to make it in secret back in the other side of the house. So he couldn't hear that we were worried and 
um, like just trying to get his heart rate down. So, and then we had to call the pulmonologist about his, his oxygen when it was below 85, I was very nervous. Um, we take his vitals at least twice a day and just keep tracking, um, that, and we can see the progression occurring. So it's reasonable that his heart medication will have to be increased again in the next month or possibly two, and that there isn't a limit to the, um, this heart medication, you know, otherwise he can start suffering from seizures and things like that. So we really are, there's not much more that can be done to extend his life at this, at this point at 28 years old, but he's 10 years past, um, you know, the hope that we had that he would live to 18. And that's really directly due to the care that he gets at home um, by caregivers and his family. So, so the headline, the the title of the book about Craig is, um, uh, you know, we went past the ninth, we went past the ninth inning into the 18th inning or 18th inning or something like that. Yes. That- and I, I call it dancing on shifting sands. <laughs> that is, it's that a, is a daily much better different. title. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically I'm constantly um, taking fireballs and putting them out or figuring out what needs done. It's a constant dance every day to keep him well. Okay. Well, um, I haven't met him, but you know, wish him wish him well and good spirits through this. Um, right. I got the impression from you that he he is in pretty high spirits usually. Yeah, for the most part, and he's been watching through, and now I think he's back to watching Deep Space Nine. He's been watching through all of Star Trek, so he oh, yeah. started this year, and now he's back uh, rewatching some episodes. I think he's also watched Community and and something else. We're pr- we're pretty nerdy. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Hillary, I'm sure our our listeners would agree. I mean, there's a reason why healthcare voices are are the most trusted voices in in the country and probably in the world, healthcare givers, their voices. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out because Hillary's also been working with me on a program called Healthcare Voices, where we are really lifting up, as you said, Jordy, um, home health workers and uh, actually nurses and also so hospital workers and people who work in nursing homes. And we're developing um, basically kind of a, a sourcing uh, for podcasts and for radio so that people can hear very directly the stories like we just heard from Hillary. Um, so that, you know, there's no, there's no middle person between all of that. And so that people can really understand firsthand what it is that happens when we are caring for others and, and, and the challenges that we might have, and also the incredible victories that we have too. And so um, we, are, we are doing that. So if you would like to um, have uh, Hillary, uh, if you're listening to this and you're at a radio station or another podcast, and you'd like to have Hillary or some other healthcare voice, um, we can get you hooked up through, uh, through this podcast. Just reach out to us and, um, and we'll be happy to, to see if we can get someone who is at bedside, someone who is like a firsthand knowledge about what is happening, not only during a pandemic, but but just in the course of, of caring for others. That's great. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up with that for sure. So here, here's kind of a last, um, we should try and all limit ourselves to a, a, a short answer, but I, I think it, it's kind of interesting. We've been through a year, like what's one thing that looking forward, you think will never change or should never change sort of going forward. And I'll go first because I, I have one. Um, I know for me, um, the, the the extent to which with rural organizing and all this community work we've been doing, the extent to which we've been able to use video conferencing has been a huge boon. And we've actually, I think, been able to make more progress in some ways than we than we realized. And so I, I really worry that, um, you know, I've been to, for example, I've been to meetings which would normally be in person and I could never go to. These are things with local elected officials. And I'm able to connect with people from big cities. And I'm a little worried too that the, the, people, the, the, that the people who come from institutions that are larger or places with more money or more accessible, more accessible, they're in the large cities, you know, they'll, they'll say like, oh, well, we want to keep the rural people and we'll be like in sort of a, a TV Zoom ghetto on the wall being like, hey, hey, listen to us. Like, like I'm worried that that's going to happen. So what should never change is attempts to really have you know, as much as possible hybrid meetings. And, and I think, you know, I feel a, a, a little bit sugar in saying this, but I think there are an awful lot of people in, in the disabled community that that's also been an ongoing need that w- would want to benefit from that. So that's my thing that should never change coming, going forward. Do other people have one? Sam. Sure. My, my thing that should never change is um, we've gotten outside. Uh, and and that's a good thing. 
uh, our, we actually have data now and uh, like the Pennsylvania Environmental Council of PA has released a report for trails all over the state and other public spaces. It's really been, you know, we've been swamping the, the great outdoors. And I think that's just to our benefit. Um, so I would like all of us to to sort of keep that um, pick, you know, stick with your your outdoor exercise, stick with your forest bathing, stick with your also, hanging out. Yeah. Outdoor meetings. Why not? Yeah. More outdoor yeah. meetings, more. Let's bring this the uh, straw bale industry back roaring straw bales everywhere for sitting on. Yeah, we had, a, we had a fire pit uh, meeting on Monday night. Yeah. It was a lot better than the January fire pit meeting, which <laughs> 19 degrees. <laughs> So my fire pit is arriving later this week. I'm a little late to that party, but I attended one. I ordered it actually yesterday. I ordered, I had a friend look at it and say, hey, look, this looks like a really good deal. And she was like, hell yes, it is. And so I bought it. So it's on its way. But um, I would just like to add on to that then, Sam, like, um, you know, is there really a reason to eat dinner inside? Like, I don't know. Like anytime that I can, I will be outdoors eating and uh, listening to music and maybe around a campfire, like I have come to appreciate the spaces outside of my home so much more than I would have ever thought. Uh, I love all of this, <laughs> all of these ideas. Um, one of Craig's favorite things to do is have a fire pit. And so we have one in our backyard and that's been the bulk of our quality time together over the last year. So definitely we're looking to, um, get a more permanent fire pit area created. Um, and I hope that everybody enjoys being outdoors a lot more than they're used to. I prefer like outdoor living as opposed to being inside myself, um, and uh, several years ago, I had finished uh, an 1860s farmhouse that was going to be torn down. And we spent basically that entire summer living outdoors <laughs> while, while, while finishing that. So I love it. I love grilling. I love fire pits. I love camping. Um, I used to be a Girl Scout leader. Like, I, I just love being outside and being on the trails. And, and um, uh, that's definitely a big focus for us uh, moving into spring. I love it. That's um, awesome. Yeah, a thing I hope um, never changes is everyone who has realized they need to advocate, I hope they don't go back to sleep. <laughs> I hope you continue advocating and in fact, advocate even more and become more empowered to make a change in um, your own communities and making your communities a better place to live. I think that's the the thing moving out of this. I hope we continue in the future, but definitely meeting virtually. I would not have been able to do any of this. And in fact, as of last February, I wasn't able to attend a meet and confer with Secretary Miller at the Department of Human Services because I had to take care of Craig here at the house. So being able to meet virtually has been life-changing for us, in fact. So I hope more people um, become passionate and empowered to make positive change in their community because of this year. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Hillary, for coming on and sharing your story and your families and Craig's uh, and, and your mom's. And um, maybe we'll have you back sometime. Absolutely. I'd love to continue the conversation. Thanks, Jordy. Sure. Awesome. That's great. Sam, the bales of hay, I, I, people know that, pe that dogs pee on them, right? <laughs> I keep, they've also got grass growing out of them because they? they are in fact bales of hay not straw i mean my dog every time i go down there i can't really stop him i mean you should just does he like, pee on should, every single one uh no mostly the one that's kind of in the northeastmost corner i have a feeling if that was on a game show like things dogs pee on i don't know that would make the list would it i don't know like what like a family feud like, question like, bales of hay or straw right i don't know yeah really yeah. something like i think yeah. fire hydrant maybe i don't know i think you're right actually it was straw not hay i think that i miss miss um i, miss I think grassified it miss grass gender well it. no 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 it would be better if they were straw bales but they are hay bales oh okay so that's why they're growing oh, um, i was gonna say because straw i think would be more durable because it's more it and it doesn't cellulose. have seeds so uh -huh. this is a taxonomic distinction that matters <laughs> So you missed that, Hillary, is that I'm sort of famous for stirring up trouble online with like, is a hot dog a sandwich? And then just letting people just letting people argue about it and then enjoying it. And and I and Sam, Sam totally knows my MO. Like I, 
I don't care that much. I just find it fascinating. Right, uh, another, but I like uh, to hassle him about it. Yeah. <laughs> I basically tell him the entire, you know, premise is wrong. Yeah. These are, or like, these are the debatable things in life. Yeah. yeah. Right. Debates I'm, over things that do not matter. Right. So the whole genre, when the whole the genre is kind of interesting. I don't know if what the Leon Block. It's a good. It's a show. It's basically a show. I don't. I don't really know quite what the line is between podcast and show. I mean, we record and then release. It's not live. Although I I keep thinking about it would be cool to have um, call ins or other things. Um, but that may be another format. Anywho, is there anything anybody wants cut? Along the wine We've tended to rock and road. When along came a semi with a high and canvas covered load. If you're going to conch a hawking horse with me, you can ride. And so I climbed into the cab and then I settled down inside. He said, if you can't take these twists and turns, man, I don't blame you. And I said, listen, I've traveled every road in Pennsylvania. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed valleys there, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. Been to Millview, Rockview, Waterloo, Lackawanna, Fairview, Bellevue, Sweet Roots, Susquehanna, Lewisburg, Stroudsburg, Gillysburg, Orbis, Sony, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh. Mountain. Top Glen Rock, Flat Rock, Sunbury, St. Mary, Shick, Shanty, Big Shanty, I'm a dandy. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed the valley's fair, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel ever had my share, man. I've been everywhere. Been to Belfont, Southmont, Westmont, Wombelsdorf, Nordmont, Dormont, Lebanon, Holmes Wharf, Cedar Springs, Bowling Springs, Chess Springs, Center Bridge, Center Sport, Leesport, Williamsport, Brackenridge, Lumber City, Central City, Lake City, Clearfield, Westfield, Winfield, Richfield, Big Deal. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I crossed the valley's fair, man. I leave the mountain air, man. Travel ever had my share, man. I've been everywhere. Glen, Will Penn, Tunnelton, Conestoga, Bakerton, Curry Run, Smoke Run, Sanitoga, Slickville, Smithville, Flicksville, Max Tony, Youngwood, Edgewood, Hopwood, Punks Tony, Whitehall, Blue Ball, Center Hall, North Apollo, Jelen, Over, Low, Laredo, Let's Go. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I crossed the valley, spare, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel ever had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been everywhere. Penn's Creek, Pine Creek, Chambersburg, Middle Creek, Blakesley, Falls Creek, Shippensburg, Johnstown, Allentown, Shepherdstown, Lords Valley, Deasetown, Doylestown, Downingtown, Cherry Valley, Plain Grove, Mill Grove, Mechanics Road, Swissvale, Ferndale, Carbondale, Monaga, Halo, oh well. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I crossed the valley, spare, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel ever had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed the valley, spare, man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel ever had my share, man. I've been everywhere. Oh, I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. 